on recent discovery. Okay. All right. Good morning. Today is May 17th, 2013. My name is Mark Tarantino. I'm here at the Burlington County Bar Association headquarters for our oral history project. And today we're going to interview Barry T. Parker. Let me tell you a few things about Barry and then we'll have a number of questions and some good stories. Barry T. Parker was born in Mount Holly, New Jersey on December 12, 1932. He attended local schools in Mount Holly and graduated from Bordentown Military Institute in 1950. Barry's college years at Bucknell University were from 1950 to 1954. From 1954 to 1956, he served as an infantry first lieutenant in the United States Army in Friedberg, Germany. He then attended Rutgers Law School, graduating in 1960. He was admitted to the New Jersey Bar later that year and became a member of the law firm now known as Parker McKay. Barry soon became a partner in the Parker McKay and Criscolo law firm and practiced with a number of influential attorneys including his father, Harold T. Parker, brother David A. Parker, Robert Criscolo, Honorable Mark Baldwin, Stephen Mushinsky, and Philip Norcross. During the 1980s and early 1990s, Barry was instrumental in the expansion of Parker, McKay, and Criscolo from a local county law practice to one of South Jersey's largest and most influential law firms. Barry was involved in politics early in his career. He was elected to the New Jersey General Assembly in 1966 and served there until 1971, including a term as majority leader in 1970. Barry was the Speaker of the General Assembly and Acting Governor in 1971. In 1972, he was elected to the State Senate and served until 1981. From 1980 to 1981, he was the Republican Minority Leader in the State Senate. In 1981, Barry announced his candidacy for the Governor of New Jersey. He lost in the Republican primary to Thomas Kane, who was elected Governor that year. Barry was co-chairman of the Kane campaign for South Jersey along with future New Jersey Supreme Court Justice Marie Garibaldi for North Jersey. Barry's legal practice comprised a wide range of governmental and administrative law with an emphasis on health care, insurance, and public finance. He was bond counsel for both private and governmental entities. During his career, Barry served as counsel to the Burlington County Bridge Commission, attorney for the South Jersey Port Corporation, and as general counsel to the New Jersey State Firemen's Association. He was also a former member on the, and on the board of directors of the Mount Holly Water Company and Elizabethtown Water Company. Barry is still of counsel to the Parker McKay Law Firm. He now spends most of his time close to the sunny Florida coast, gardening, fishing, and golfing. And I want to show you a memento that I borrowed from Edna Moore of Vincenttown, New Jersey, who used to work for Barry and uh, Barry's father. Um, this is the button from 1981 when Barry ran for governor, and it's a cherished possession of Edna Moore. I have to give it back, so I, I can't let you have it today, Barry, but uh, welcome. It's great to have you here, and uh, there's so much, to, so much to ask you about, so much to say. Thank you, Mark. So uh, why don't we start with your early years. Tell us about growing up in Mount Holly. Well, it's a typical uh, country town back in those days. Uh, we we uh, played uh, football in the backyard and basketball in the backyard. An interesting side note, uh, most of the, some of the judges uh, and uh, top lawyers in South Jersey played basketball in our backyard including Jack Gary, who was a federal judge in Camden, the Claypoles, uh, one, she's, her, her brother was, uh, a, a, played at Duke, I believe, and she's a judge now, so it was a neighborhood community. Everybody knew everybody else. Everybody uh, worked and played with each other, and uh, it was a great town to grow up in. Do you remember your home address? Oh, it was Bartram Manor, right? Uh, there's a school there now on, on uh, I think, the uh, middle school, Mount Holly Middle School is right behind it. Besides sports, what else did you do in the early days? Well, we, I played basketball uh, in, in high school and in college. Uh, we fished and hunted. Uh, a lot of, we had woods behind our uh, home behind Bartram Manor and, 
as kids growing up, we played and built forts in the woods and and uh, did a lot of hunting and fishing and just nature nature projects. Who are some of your other neighbors? Some of my neighbors, well, uh, Matt Sleeper, the Sleepers, Howard Sleeper, was a neighbor right behind me. And uh, they owned the Mount Howley Hurl. And, and Matt was the Director of Economic Development in Burlington County and then went uh, to the state of New Jersey, worked for the uh, New Jersey Public TV with, with Diane Allen. Uh, the foremans lived behind me. Uh, his dad was a major in the state police and he was one of the foremost uh, matrimonial lawyers in, in uh, South Jersey. Uh, people by the name of Cooney and now Bob Byer, the Bob Byer locksmith. Uh, he was the neighbor on the, uh, in the neighborhood and Bob Chris Cole and Martin Haynes lived in the neighborhood. Now you went to high school where? I went to high school, I started in, in uh, Rand Cocos Valley or Mount Holly High School back then and uh, then transferred to uh, Bordentown Military and I graduated from there in 1950. What sports did you play in high school? I played soccer and basketball in high school. And then went directly from high school to Bucknell? Right, went from high school to Bucknell. What was Bucknell like back then? Oh, well, Bucknell was a, a neat school, and interestingly enough, I was supposed to go to Lafayette and play basketball at Lafayette. The coach was Norman Van Bredekoff back then, famous Knicks player. And I was the youngest kid in the class, and, and they had a lot of veterans coming back from the Second World War, and they said, oh, we overbooked you're young, go back and play basketball another year, and you're still accepted to Lafayette. I said, oh man, this was in the middle of the summer. So Jim Davis lived next door, and he was the sen senator, being a Democrat, but he was a good friend. And uh, he talked to my dad, and he said, we can get Barry into Bucknell University. And I said, okay, I didn't know Bucknell then. And I then went to Buck, Bucknell University. The Davis family were instrumental in building the, the uh, basketball arena at Bucknell called Davis Gym. And that's how I got to Bucknell to play basketball. And you did play for the team? Yes, I played four years at Bucknell. Did you, uh, did you do a lot of scoring? I averaged, uh, and I... <coughs> Just recently looked at the Bucknell uh, history, and I averaged uh, 15.6 my senior year. So 15 points. We did not have a very good team, however. And what was your height? I was six four, six four, which so, was moderate height in those days. Did you participate in a fraternity? Yes, I was in Sigma Chi fraternity. Um, now, you also were uh, part of the ROTC program there. Yes, I was uh, in the ROTC program, and that's how I ended up in, in, uh, in uh, Germany in the 4th Infantry Division. What, what happened was, uh, if you were not in uh, the Marine Corps Reserve or the Army ROTC, you were not uh, deferred from the Korean War. And uh, my roommate, who was an All-American football player, Bert Townage, uh, was drafted uh, his junior year, and he went in the Army for a year and a half, too, right? So if you didn't belong to either the Marine Corps Reserve or the, the Army ROTC, you were going to war. So you were commissioned upon graduation? Yes. And this was in 1954? Yes. Uh, tell us about your years as a, an infantry lieutenant in Germany. Oh, yeah, well, that was interesting. Uh, I, I, I graduated from Benning, and I went to Ranger training. I graduated from Ranger training. I had originally signed up for Airborne, 
because I figured if I'm going to war, going to Korea, I wanted to be with one of the best. Uh, as it turned out, they required us to re-change our category, so I never finished airborne, and then I was sent on orders to the 4th Infantry Division in uh, Friedberg, Germany. Actually, the 4th was in Frankfurt, Germany. The 8th Infantry Regiment, which I served in, was stationed in uh, Friedberg, Germany. And I was, I had what they called the counter-fire platoon, which was a platoon that had, uh, had directional finding equipment to attack direct fire units such as a tank or a machine gun and we were set up to work and counteract those those facilities. Uh, as it turned out I was really uh, uh, really attached to the 8th Infantry Regiment because it was the all user at championship basketball team in Germany at the time, at the time, and I they picked me and sent me there to regimental headquarters. So I played basketball all winter, and then in the summer, because my platoon was attached to regimental headquarters, I was the army aggressor in the name. NATO war games that summer. So all summer long I spent in the field as the enemy to the, the U.S. and English forces that were on maneuvers. Did you train in Grafenvier? I was near Grafenvier. Uh, Wildflecken is where we were and that was right on the uh, Czechoslovakian border. In fact, we were participating in a, a new military maneuver called gyroscope, which was moving whole infantry divisions to see how fast they could move them from one place to another. And the 4th Infantry Division was being sent back to the United States, and, and the 3rd Armored Division was replacing us. And as we were moving, uh, starting to rotate back to the United States, the Russians invaded Hungary, and I figured we are on our way, but there was no border with Hungary. You had to go through either Czechoslovakia or um, uh, Austria to get there, and we thought, sure, we were going, but Eisenhower, I guess, they, we never moved, so nothing was ever done. Uh, then when you returned from the army, did you immediately go to law school? Well, I, I yeah, I, well, I still had a couple months here and I was assigned to Fort Dix uh, and a training facility for a couple months. And then I, uh, I, while I was here, I attended Temple uh, to get some extra credits and do some, get some accounting and uh, uh, math courses. And then started uh, when I got out in November. Uh, started at Rutgers, Camden, uh, in in uh, on January 21st, I believe it was. Interestingly, uh, Rutgers Camden had just been assumed by uh, Rutgers University, and it was the College of South Jersey at that time. And there was talk that they were going to close the South Jersey Law School. And of course, the South Jersey legislators stopped that. Uh, but uh, there were only three of us in my class when I started. Who were they? One was a fellow by the name of Frank Sevier, who was one of the, he was a, a math teacher at Rutgers College. And uh, he was a consultant for Burroughs Corporation. He was one of the first computer experts. And he, he, he was one of the uh, first year law students with me. And another fellow by the name of John Kelly, who didn't make it through, but then graduated from Creighton Law School and became Governor Schaefer's 
Council in Pennsylvania, and Frank Sevier, Dr. Sevier, uh, left Rutgers because he was not happy with his grades. I studied with him almost every night. He was wonderful to help me as a veteran. And when the grades came out, his grades were almost the same as mine, and he was furious. So he went to Temple and graduated with honors, then went to Temple Law School, or Medical School, and graduated from medical school. So he had his doctor's degree in mathematics, his JD degree in law, and his MD degree. And he went to the Blackwell firm in Miami, big, big law firm. But his interest was always in, in education and he was one of the three finalists for the first superintendent of the Burlington County College when they hired the, uh, the superintendents. Who were some other uh, law school uh, classmates? Harris Cotton. Harris Cotton was a unique individual, a great friend. He was a rabid Democrat, and of course all through politics I was running up against him, but we were good friends. Uh, he, he ended up being the prosecutor in uh, Gloucester County. His father was one of the great trial lawyers, like Piney Parker, my dad, and like like uh, Jim Davis so, uh, in, in, in Gloucester County. Uh, I also was with a, a fellow by the name of Wally McBain, who became the the dean or the assistant dean of Marquette Law School. Uh, another um, great friend, of course, was Ernie Seaver. Ernie Seaver was the municipal judge in, I think, half of the municipalities in Burlington County in the 1960s and 70s. And he was a, a, a great friend. Um, Gene Shell? Yeah, Eugene Shell was another one. Gene is still practicing, I think, in Gloucester County. Uh, he was very, there was another fellow by the name of Larry Knowles, who went on to be, I think, a professor and assistant dean at Kentucky Law School. So we had a pretty distinguished class. Uh, uh, the, Two, two of my friends got me through law school. They were Carl Schultz, who was a lawyer here for many years with Diamond, Haynes, and Bunny, and, and then on his own. And another attorney by the name of Alvin Gross. They studied. When I got out of law school, I graduated in, not graduated, I got finished classes in uh, the end of January. The bar exam was on the 21st of February. That's only we had weeks. 21 days to study for the bar. They had taken the bar review course and Alvin and Carl Schultz and I started. The day I got out of school, one day on each course, we went through it and we started at 9 o'clock in the morning and went till 12 o'clock at night. And uh, they were instrumental in me passing the bar. I passed it the first time uh, on that date and never took the bar review course. And, and uh, the university wasn't happy with me taking the exam. They, they're rated on how many pass the first time and what their professors do and et cetera. And they said, you know, don't take it, you're not going to be able to pass. But Alvin and, uh, and Carl got me through and I passed. Another interesting sidelight. Back then we had to do a clerkship for a year. And I took the exam before I had graduated from college, before I got my diploma, and before I had completed the clerkship. So we would take the exam and you always look to see when the results came out, the envelope, whether you held it up to the light and it was blue or pink. 
Well, I held mine up till the light when it came in on April Fool's Day, April the 1st. And I looked, it wasn't blue. I looked, I said, it doesn't look like it's pink. I said, what, what in the world have I got here? So I opened it up and it said, you have passed the bar exam, but you are admitted, will be admitted only on a provisional basis until you complete your clerkship. So April Fool's Day turned out to be a good day for me. What did you do with the clerkship? What did I do with the clerkship? I clerked to Parker McKay and Chris Cole. And then you stayed there for your Yes, and I, I stayed stayed with them. Uh, and Mr. Chris Cole, Bob Chris Cole, was just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful man. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And the other partner, McKay, was a senator. He was the senator in the, in the uh, New Jersey State Senate for Burlington County. And, uh, but Bob Chris Cole was my mentor as a young, young lawyer. So you started with Parker McKay and Chris Cole in 1960. Yes. Well, actually, I started clerking when I was in law school. I started clerking with him in 57, I guess it was. Tell us about your dad. My dad, Piney. Well, I guess he's a, a bit of a, a legend here in the county. Uh, he started with Clifford Powell, who was in the firm back then was uh, Powell, Hendrickson, and Parker. Uh, he worked for them in the law office, cleaning. He was a cleaning boy cleaned the law office for Cliff Powell. Cliff Powell grew up in Lumberton. My dad was from Lumberton. And so when he was working for them, he was drive, driving the school bus and he studied law. I never went to college, never went to law school, and he passed the bar the first time he took it in 1924. He was 21 years old. He then became uh, one of New Jersey's top trial lawyers and defense. We did defense negligence, mostly insurance companies, travelers, Aetna, INA, etc. Uh, he was then inducted into the American College of Trial Lawyers and was named New Jersey Trial Lawyer of the Year by the New Jersey State Bar. Uh, incidentally, my brother got the same award years later. As far as I know, it was the only time uh, that a father and son had received that top award in the state of New Jersey. He also was prosecutor of Burlington County from 1945 to 1955. And his assistant then was the, another famous lawyer. Dominic Ferrelli, who became prosecutor and also judge. What was it like to work with your father? <laughs> My father was a bit of a terror. He, uh, he didn't tolerate any nonsense. He was, uh, uh, you performed or you got hell. He was, he was tough. He was a tough taskmaster. He was tough on the lawyers. He was, he was a tough trial lawyer. Um, what year did your father pass away? 1983. And was he still working? Uh, at the time? Well, he had had some cancer and was struggling with the cancer, but he he stayed with the firm, yes, until he died. Who else uh, did you work with in the firm in the 1960s? Well, uh, in the 60s it was McKay and Chris Cole. Bill Webster was uh, the top associate in those days. And Bill was a top trial lawyer, a very aggressive, tough trial lawyer. And uh, he, incidentally, it was Jack Gary's brother-in-law, the, the chief judge, uh, federal judge in New Jersey, who, who also grew up here. Uh, I, the next was Bob Partlow came in. Bob was Bob uh, played football at Columbia and went to Penn, I think, law school. And uh, he was another tough practitioner, but 
one of the better municipal and practitioners in the county for years. Did a lot of uh, uh, developer work. As the, the county grew, there were a lot of developers. We did a lot of developer work, including Toll Brothers and, and the like. Uh, I worked, uh, well, with Don Gatos. Don Gatos was my immediate associate. Uh, he was recommended by the torch professor in, <coughs> in Rutgers Camden and we got a lot of referrals from the, the professors in Camden, uh, at Rutgers Camden. Eve Veenstra, who was another great trial lawyer, who was American College of Trial Lawyers, worked with Eve. Um, then Steve Mashinsky, Mark Baldwin, and Phil Norcross, all much younger. Yeah. Richard Dill, tell us about him. He was he was with you in the sixties. Richard Dill, Dick Dick Dill. Dick did real estate tax work, and yeah, Dick was with us for. So well, he's still doing tax foreclosure work and tax sale work in the office. <laughs> he's still working at eighty five or eighty six. John Devlin was also Oh, there. John, John Devlin. Uh, John was our, our, he was the tax man. He had his master's degree in, uh, in tax, I believe, from Villanova University. He went to LaSalle, then Villanova. And he, he did all of our big estate work, all our tax work, and those who worked for him, yeah, under him, yeah. What year did your brother David uh, join the firm? He joined the firm in... Uh, Three years after I did, he was he was a freshman at Rutgers Law School when I was a senior, but he had a little bit of a problem with with the law school. They they used to have a, a law or a rule that uh, if you maintained at least a seventy four average, you could pass go pass and get your degree from Rutgers Law School. Well, his senior year, he decided not to go to class. But he passed everything with a grade of between 70 and 74. And they made him come back for another year because he did he, And they changed that law. They uh, didn't let him graduate. He had to come back, so he was a year behind me. What type of work did he do? He was a defense lawyer. He was a trial lawyer. He was the top trial lawyer in in the, the county in South Jersey, and was also a member of the American College of Trial Lawyers, uh, the New Jersey Defense Institute. He was the head of that, and he was the top trial lawyer in the state of New Jersey, like his father. Did you enjoy working with him and your dad all at the same uh, time? My brother and I did not get along well at all. Uh, early on, I was kind of in politics and, and doing municipal work, well, totally different from him. And we just didn't get along as siblings. There was a rivalry, I guess. And when my father died, he says, ah, well, I'm going to take the Defense Department and him and I said to David that I don't think it's a good idea. You better look at the revenues and the, the stream. And I said, not only that, you got to look at the future. I said, uh, the, all of the defense firms, all the insurance companies are starting to go to house counsel. And incidentally, Tim Annan was another member of, my law, of our law firm at that time. INA wanted to set up a house council to see if it would work in the early 70s. We gave Tim five years leave of absence to go run the house council position at INA in Philadelphia. Tim ran it so well that INA started their own house council thereafter. Tim came back with our law firm and, and uh, that was the start of house councils. And I said to my brother, and with all the lawyers, Webster, and we had a lot of lawyers, maybe half of our firm 
was doing defense litigation. And I said, you better look down the road and see what's, what's coming because they were going to house council. We talked and agreed and looked at the finances and we agreed to stay together. My brother and I have never had a bad word since and when my dad died, I handled the estate. I'd done some estate work and before John Devlin and with John and uh, I handled the, my dad's estate. He never questioned a penny on anything we ever did. Never had an argument with my brother since. Let's talk about the the county courthouse and county facilities uh, in the 1960s. Can you tell us what that was like? Well, in the 1960s we had four judges back then. And, uh, then I, when I was in the legislature, I sponsored the, uh, the bill to increase it from four. Uh, the judges were, well, originally it was only two. It was originally Judge Drink and Judge, uh, Judge McGann. Then we had Judge Belopolsky, Judge Kramer, Judge... McGann, Wood, Judge Wood, Judge Wood, and uh, they were wonderful judges. Judge Wood was a just a consummate gentleman. Everybody loved trying. McGann was a, a little tough. He was he was a plaintiff's lawyer in his day, and he he kind of beat up on some of the uh, the uh, defense guys. Uh, Judge Belopolsky was very easy to get along with. Judge Van Skyver was 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 very conservative, I would say. He was, McGann was a plaintiff side judge, and, and Judge uh, Van Skyver was more the conservative judge. What was Judge Drink like? Well, I didn't know Judge Drink very well. Judge Drink was an interesting guy. Um, he was very active in the mental health setup, and he set up what is now the drink facility in Burlington County for their mental health uh, program. I didn't know him very well. He was a very close friend of my dad, Piney's. They did a lot together, and uh, and uh, I, that's about all I can really remember. He died. Uh, early on. Was Judge Martino also there? Oh, Judge Martino was a, was the assignment judge back in, and he's the one that des decided the Mount Laurel uh, decision, the, the housing decision, which is famous in New Jersey and all over the country. And interestingly enough, that decision started as a result of the zoning and planning in Mount Laurel Township as Mount Laurel Township started to grow. And Taylor Wiseman was the engineer back then. I was, and Parker McKay was the attorney for the planning board and for the Municipal Utilities Authority in Mount Laurel. I think Bill Colsey from Davis, Jim Davis's firm was the, the solicitor and there's a section of the town that started to develop uh, that they didn't want to develop and it was called Springville. It was an old Jewish community that had been used as summer, summer camp for the Jewish families in Philadelphia. And it had turned into a, a kind of run down and turned into a low income area where the town didn't really want it to develop. They would not extend water to that area. And as a result of that, the zoning came out, they didn't zone that area, and that started the, the, Mount, the Mount Oral decisions. What about the courthouse in the 1960s? The courthouse was right across the street from here. It was the old courthouse. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think, Judge 
Judge McGann was upstairs. We had two. They had the upstairs and downstairs, and they were the only two courtrooms we had. And then when we got more judges, uh, Judge Kramer and, and uh, um, Judge Belopolsky, when when they increased the bar, uh, they built the new county courthouse. But the old county courthouse was neat. The Sarah Gates office was in there, uh, or right next door. The prosecutor, the uh, prosecutor's office, I believe, was in there. <laughs> so they had everything in the old courthouse. Neat, neat old courthouse. Were you active in the Burlington County Bar Association back then? Yes, I started out. My first couple of years, I was the secretary. Uh, I can't remember how many years I was secretary, but I guess it's in your records here. Um, and I, I took the minutes and did it, yeah, yes. And the Bar Association was really pretty unique back then. It was really a close-knit group, a lot of camaraderie, and uh, we would have a picnic every year down at Jim Davis's uh, camp down in the Cedar Run. And uh, I, I had pictures of Judge Ferrelli, and I forget who gave them to me, but I had a lot of pictures and I turned them over to the Bar Association. And Frank Hartman wrote an article about it in the Straight Word a couple months ago. What were those picnics like? Oh, they were fun. They, <laughs> they, they would get, get down there and get drinking and having kielbasa and hot dogs and sandwiches. Bear, bear, bear ass swimming in the in the creek, uh, gambling. They would be playing crap and and, and poker. There were pictures of uh, John Diamond and Herman Belopolsky. Herman was a judge. My dad, I think, was prosecutor part of that time. They were down there gambling, and. Uh, one day they had to stop because they had heard that they were going to get raided by the state police. That uh, the attorney general at that time was uh, was from Berlin County, lived in Edgewater Park, and was in Camden, and I, I'll think of his name in a second, but he was a rabid Democrat. He was getting ready to run for governor, and he wanted Piney. He wanted to catch him gambling. And so that was the end of the gambling at the at the uh, picnics and they kind of just died away. At the time Parker McKay was, the law firm was located in Mount Holly. Yes, right down the street from here. Did you participate in the lunches that they would have? Uh, yes. Can you oh, tell us yes. about that? Yeah, uh, as I said, there was a lot of camaraderie among the bar. Most of the law firms in Burlington County were all late located here in Mount Holly. Our firm with all the lawyers uh, Pal and Davis was right next door with all their lawyers, Jim Davis, Cliff Powell, Paul Kramer, uh, Frank Hartman, Bill Colsey, Bob Dietz. Uh, then there was George Hillman, who had been in prosecutor's office, was right, I think, right here. Uh, then Diamond Haynes and Bunning, and all the lawyers would go to the Car Slakes uh, dining room for lunch. And we all would have like the whole whole area set aside for for the lawyers, and all the judges would come up, and all the visiting lawyers would would come up and have lunch with us, and uh, they would have various dinners there. My dad would was a, quite a fisherman, was, uh, and he brought striped bass up and he would bring ducks and they would cook them up and have different uh, different menus for the bar and it was just a, a great great place to meet and eat and, uh, and uh, everybody went to find out what was going on with the bar. Now as you got into the 1980s the firm expanded. Yes. Can you tell us some of the attorneys who joined? Yeah. The, the firm expanded. We we started to get into healthcare stuff. I Phil Norcross's father 
was the head of the IUE at Martin Marietta, what is Martin Marietta now. And they had had a problem and I had helped them out and so I had gotten somewhat friendly with, with, with him. And, and they passed the, passed the National Health Planning Act in 1969 and it, had, it was made up of providers and, and consumers. The providers were the hospitals and the doctors. And we were very close to the administrator in uh, uh, Burlington County Memorial Hospital, now Virtua, who was heading up up this uh, uh, health systems agency. And the labor unions ran the consumers. And George's dad, or Phil's dad, George Sr., well, it controlled that. I was then appointed the attorney for the HSAs, and we had to approve every financing, construction, or expansion of any hospital in South Jersey. So we started getting in with the doctors and the hospitals through that, and it was at that time when the insurance companies were going to house council, and, but the hospitals were having trouble getting insurance. And a fellow by the name of McDonough, Dick McDonough, who was former commissioner of insurance, was affiliated with Parker McKay, came as a partner to Parker McKay for a period of time. And he set up what they called the health care insurance exchange so that hospitals could get insurance. Well, they had to have experienced trial lawyers, so Parker McKay fit in with my father and with my brother mainly, and Eve Veenstra, uh, all the young lawyers, Tom Walsh, Carolyn Reinhardt, Carolyn Sleeper, uh, they all came in and, and uh, that's how they got into the, uh, the defense of the medical profession, which they still do today. And now most of the hospitals are self-insured, but we continue to, to represent them, so. Did you eventually outgrow the facilities for the, the firm in Mount Holly? That, that's what happened. Back then, with the healthcare expansions growing, for instance, I was the attorney for Hampton Hospital. I was, you know, been doing the HSA work with, I was involved with all the hospitals and all the doctors and, of course, the labor unions with George Norcross Sr., Phil's dad. And we just had to expand to cover and so we grew in the, in the, the medical defense end and the, the facilities here in Burlington County and Mount Halley were, were not big enough and a company called Lim Limpro was run by Jay Kramer uh, as a partner from here, was expanding in Marlton. We represented him and we moved with him when he went and built Marlton Square where the Green Tree Center in uh, Marlton and we moved over there in 1984. And by then, do you recall how many attorneys were in the firm with you at the new place? We had 50 by then, so I believe they're up to like 70 now. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how many they have. A few of their partners have just retired. They, all of the young people I hired are re starting to reach retirement age. Steve Mashinsky, Steve just, he, I hired Steve here in Mount Holly. And, and Mark Baldwin, who fired them both the same night. And, uh, and Steve just retired. Uh, 65, it was last week. Did you hire Rich Andronisi? I hired Rich, well, I didn't, but several, as, as I indicated, several came from Rutgers University. And uh, Professor Ireton sent me sent me at least seven lawyers. They sent me Frank Armanenti, who was a tax attorney, who was up in Heightstown. 
and it owns the uh, the, the barrister, the alchemist, and the barrister up in Princeton. Uh, he was the first. Then Don Gatos was the next. He was sent up. Eve Venture was sent up, and then Rich Andonici was referred up here by a. And when Rich came, he clerked for us for a while, but we didn't have an opening for Rich, and he became Dominic Ferrelli's law clerk for a year before he could then join the law firm. But he came in, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think he was about the same time as Steve Mashinsky and Mark, so. I want to ask you some uh, questions about your political career. Why don't we take a short break?